Let's pray. Our Father, we acknowledge that it is you who has brought us here today. Your Spirit has led each and every one of us here. You gather your people. And you speak to us. We thank you for speaking to us through your word. And as we consider it today, we we do pray that you would be enabling us to not just focus, but to be changed. That you would keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and be encouraged to live for him. So that he might be glorified and so that we might also have joy in him. And for his sake we pray. Amen. Well, I must admit, I had an illustration to start this sermon, and I really don't like it, so I'm not going to use it. Uh, Today we're, we're going to be thinking about freedom in Christ, and what, in particular, Galatians Five has to say about our freedom in Christ. Uh, the talk today kind of follows a, a bit of a info of context of where we've come from. We're going to look at a contrast that Paul sets up between law and grace. If we're freed by someone into something, we're freed from something. And so there's a contrast that gets set up by Paul as we look at what freedom in Christ looks like. Then we're going to have a look at what freedom in Christ is not. And finally, we'll have a think about what it might look like for us in application. So that's where we're going today. Uh, I'm sorry that... Actually, yeah, I'm sorry that there's no whiz-bang illustration to start off with, but we are reading God's Word, and so we're going to get stuck into that. So have your Bibles open... Uh, And by way of context, last week we explored the comparison between duty and love. That love is the better way. And our response to God and to others should should also be one of love and not duty. Uh, And I say response because we also saw that God himself acts towards us out of love rather than duty. We've seen again and again and again over the last few weeks that through his unbelievable gift of grace, God adopts us into his family. Do you remember that? He makes us his sons and heirs. He places us in a position that is up up there with the Son of God, with Jesus Christ himself. He doesn't owe us but he loves us. And so we saw last week in chapter 4, verse 31, the start of our reading today, that we are children of the free woman, recipients of God's love, freed to love God and others. For those who are in Christ, God has birthed us into a new family, not of slavery, but of freedom. And again, this can only ever be of his doing. We can't bring ourselves into God's family. Only God can do that, which is the message and the gift of grace. Well, now in chapter 5, verse 1, Paul explains how this gift of grace is one of freedom. And again, his big idea is right there in verse 1. Have a read of it. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Paul says, true freedom is found in the grace-filled gospel of Christ. And he says this in the rest of our passage by setting up this contrast between the two different ways, the way of law, of religion, and the way of grace. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at this contrast Uh, and see what we can find out about the way of law and this way of grace. Well, first, the way of law is the way of slavery, whereas the way of grace is one of freedom. Chapter 431, So then, friends, 
We are children, not of the slave, but of the free woman. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Those who are bound by the law, by religion, are enslaved, Paul says, by having to do the right things. Say the right things so that God might somehow accept us. But those who are brought into God's family as a gift of his grace alone are freed from this law. They no longer have to do anything. Christ has set us free. The way of law is one of slavery. The way of grace is freedom. Which brings out another contrast in, these, in this passage. The way of law is about things that we are unable to do. The way of grace is already done for us. Galatians 5.3 Once again, I testify to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obliged to obey the entire law. So Paul's argument is, if you want to do religious things to get right with God... You can't just do one thing according to the law. You need to fulfill the whole law. You need to perfectly love God. You need to perfectly love your neighbour as yourself. Well, how are you going with that? It's impossible, isn't it? It's impossible because we are all broken. We all know it's impossible which only builds the burden that we bear if we rely on the law. But the way of grace is different. There is nothing that we must do, for it is already done. Chapter 431, we are children. Christ has set us free, already done it. He's done everything to make us acceptable to God. What a burden is lifted off us when we realise that we don't have to do anything to earn God's favour, to impress our Creator God. We simply accept His grace. This again is the contrast between law and grace. What we are unable to do on one hand and what is already done for us. Now, because we are unable to fulfil the law... As we've seen, there's another contrast between the law and grace, one of futility and one of hope. Galatians 5, 2. Listen, I, Paul, am telling you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And then verse 4. You who want to be justified by the law have cut yourselves off from Christ. You've fallen away from grace. If we follow the law, Christ will not be useful, who we know is the only way to the Father. Our good deeds, our piety is useless and futile if we trust the law instead of God's grace through Christ. But the way of grace, of what God has done for us already, well, that's the way to the Father. And so it is filled with much hope. Galatians 5 verse 5. For through the Spirit of Christ, by faith in Christ, we eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. There's a future. There's a hope. The contrast between law and grace is one of futility on one hand and one of hope on the other but the contrast keeps building because grace is God's way of working not law so we also have a contrast of truth and falsehood those who had come into the church saying that people had to fulfill the law had to circumcise themselves in order to be acceptable to God Well, these are people who, Galatians 5 verse 7, prevented the church from obeying the truth. 
They're not from God, verse 8, who is the truth and the only source of truth. The gospel of grace through faith in Jesus Christ is from God. It is the truth, the only truth. And Paul's been talking about this all along in Galatians so far. And so those who say otherwise are confused, verse 10. They don't adhere to the truth. But how can the law be false if God gave it to us in the first place? Well, that's a really good question that you were just asked me, isn't it? Well, even in the Old Testament, God still works by grace, not law. He is the first mover. He creates. He reveals. He delivers. He saves. And then he prescribes our appropriate response. What's that response? Well, he gives us the law. But the law becomes false when we get this mixed up, when we get the sequence wrong and we say the law comes first in order to earn. When we think about it's the th- about the things that we must do to earn God's salvation, his favour, rather than as an appropriate response to God's grace. Well, we'll think about this a little bit more later. But we see that this is another contrast. The religious way of law, which is false, and the way of grace, which is truth. Which makes way for our final contrast that Paul sets up, and that's the way, and and that is that the way of the law is divisive, and the way of the of grace is unifying. Have a look from Galatians five, starting in verse thirteen. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. As religion, the way of the law, focuses on what we do, forgets the heart, that is, to love God and love people, well, it, ca- it causes division in God's church. How? Well, it divides God's family into people who are good enough and people who aren't. Whether it's about circumcision, as was the case in Galatia, or whether it's about any other host of things that we say we must do in order to earn salvation, no, no. Jesus has done. Religion divides. And we see in verse 15 that the results are devastating. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. The family of God devouring one another like wild dogs. It's horrific. And so it's no wonder Paul uses very strong words in verse 12 to condemn those who would bring confusion and division in this way. I wish that those who unsettle you, who say you must be circumcised, would go the whole way. They'd castrate themselves. But by contrast, grace unifies. Jesus brings people into God's family, as we've already seen, then he's the one who affects our hearts. He enables us to love, forgive, care for our neighbour. God's grace enables us to be gracious to others. We've already seen this all through Galatians and we see it here now. And as we are gracious to others because of God's grace, well, this builds up and unifies the church. 
We don't look at the things that we do, we look at the heart. So, what's our law? We love God and we love one another. We become slaves to one another. That's radical. The way of law, the way of grace. The way of law is one of slavery, filled with obligations that we're unable to fulfil. It's false, it's futile, it causes division amongst God's people. The way of grace is one of freedom, because it's all about what Christ has already done for us. It's true, spirit-filled, hopeful. It causes unity as we continue to look to Christ and treat each other with the same grace that Christ has poured out towards us. And here's what Jesus does. He takes us from the, the way of law and he puts us in the way of grace. He does that. Do you get that? He does that. You don't do that. He does. The contrast is stark. The implication is clear. Grace is the way to go and grace is what God is doing. So we return to Paul's main exhortation. Galatians 5.1 For freedom, Christ has set us free. So, stand firm therefore, Christian, in the freedom won for you by God's grace. Do not submit again, Christian, to a yoke of slavery, the yoke of the law that you've been freed from by Christ. Well, it's important for us to think about what freedom in Christ does not mean. Freedom in Christ does not mean that we are free from the law. I'll say that again. Freedom in Christ does not mean that we are free from the law. Now, you're probably trying to pull the wax out of your ears because you thought, did he just contradict himself? Did he just say the wrong thing? Did he just contradict the scriptures? Well, let's think about that a little bit further. We'll think about it by asking a question very similar to the one that Paul asks in Romans 6. Now that we are saved by grace, given freedom in Christ, should we continue in sin so that grace might abound? By no means. The answer is no way, Jose. So, what I said was freedom in Christ does not mean that we are free from the law. Another way to put this is freedom in Christ means that we are freed from the tyranny, the punishment of the law. We no longer have to perform the law in order to earn salvation and we no longer bear its burden. But freedom in Christ does not mean that our actions do not matter. Do you get that? It still matters deeply to God that we live a godly life. To say no to evil. In other words, we are to keep God's law. Not because these things save us but because we know that these things please our God who has already saved us. Freedom in Christ is not an unfettered freedom. It's not the freedom to simply do what I like without any concerns or consequences, knowing that I can just ask for forgiveness on my deathbed. No, freedom is not lawlessness. It has a form. It has boundaries. In fact, Jesus says this. If you remember in his own words in Matthew 11, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus doesn't offer an existence without a yoke. Rather, he talks about the quality of the yoke or really the master. Master. 
In Galatians 5, we see that the law and religion has a yoke of slavery. It's futile. It's harsh. But the yoke that Jesus offers is light and easy. Freedom in Christ is not an unfettered freeman, freedom. We're not free to do our own thing, disregard words, uh, God's word and sin it up. No. But Jesus does assure us that his burden, the way of grace, is better. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. Well, what might this mean for you? Perhaps on one side of the spectrum, you feel guilty and crushed when you do the wrong thing and you know it. You think that you'll never be good enough to be acceptable to God. Well, in a sense, you're actually right. We've seen that. The law is impossible to keep. It puts a big red cross on each of our backs. But the way of grace, the gospel of God says that Jesus paid the price for you, for me. To adopt us into his family, to make us acceptable, not because of what we've done, actually in spite of what we've done, but because of what Jesus has done. Well, as we trust and follow the way of grace, we may be aware of our sins, but our sins don't need to crush us. Because Jesus has already said, you're mine. He's already paid the price for people like you and me with big red crosses on our backs. So don't just try and do the right thing. That's not going to win you any brownie points. You need to trust in Jesus to forgive you and then to help you live a godly life in response. Perhaps on the other side of the spectrum, you you know Jesus is your saviour. You trust in grace. But it's easy to dismiss the law because you're saved by grace. You conveniently look over your sin, a blasphemous word, that extra drink, a lustful stare. You look over these things because you're saved by grace and not the law. Freedom in Christ is not freedom from the law. Our sin should still grieve us. Not crush us, but grieve us. Not because our sins take away Christ's love for us. No, that's done and dusted. It's in the past. It's done. But because they actually grieve our God, who's paid a costly, deadly price to purchase our freedom. We do need to constantly remember our sin, not just in general, specific sins. Be grieved by them. And because we are saved by grace, we need to repent. We need to ask God to help us run away from sin for the glory of Christ. Well, no matter where you are on that spectrum between these two extremes, whether you're more likely to feel guilty because of your sin or more likely to dismiss your sin, we all need to actually keep looking to Christ, our Saviour. It's not trying to shift from one end of the spectrum to the other that will fix our problems, but actually as we keep looking to Christ, well, he'll help us to not be crushed by our guilt as we remember the grace that he gives. As we keep looking to Christ, he'll help us to not give in to sin or dismiss it as we remember what he's done for us. That he loves us. And what he loves and wants us to do, to live a godly life as we wait for his return. Listen to Galatians 5, 1 again. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. 
or to say it differently in Paul's words in verse 16, live by the Spirit. Do not gratify the desires of the flesh. We're going to have a little look at what that looks like to live by the Spirit and not by the flesh later on next week. Uh, But how about we pray? Now, Father, as we remember what Jesus has done for us in dying on a cross and rising to new life to redeem us from slavery, we pray that you would sear that contrast into our minds and our hearts and help us to respond rightly to you. When we try to do the right thing in order to earn your favour, we pray that you would rebuke us and remind us of the grace that Christ has won, given for us. When we forget our sin conveniently, we pray also that you might remind us of what Christ has done for us. the cost of his grace. And as we look at ourselves rightly, we pray that you would help us to repent, turn to you, and live lives that please you, not to earn your favour, but as an appropriate response to what you've done. Lord, by your spirit, help us to live spirit-filled lives. Help us to say no to what displeases you. And help us to say yes to what pleases you. And we pray all of this, that Christ might be glorified in our bodies as we wait for his return. And we thank you so much that you have made us your people. Amen.